I will share my thoughts on this chapter aided with quotes and ideas from the pulpit commentary. So um, to give background about this chapter, uh, the Israelites are in Babylon. And this is during the Babylonian captivity. Daniel has been chosen with the three others to be educated. However, he is currently not at the king's court. He's still pretty young. He's not really proven himself, really, other than about the um, only eating vegetables and not eating meat that was, that was sac sacrificed to the idols. And showing to the king that he could be just as healthy. The other men and that are, are with him can be just as healthy by eating vegetables that weren't sacrificed to the idols versus the other men who were going ahead and eating um, the meat that was sacrificed to the idols. And, they, and Daniel and his group were actually healthier and stronger. So the ruling king right now is um, Nebuchadnezzar in this chapter. So we're going to take a look at Nebuchadnezzar chapter, not Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> Daniel chapter 2. So verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to be summoned to tell the king his dream. So they came in and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O oh, king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. So here, Nebuchadnezzar, at the height of his power and prosperity, is troubled with a terrible dream. And this goes to show no amount of prosperity can give you peace of mind. High rank can often be a source of anxiety. We may be quick to envy privileged people, but in many ways we actually should feel sorry for them. There's a quote that says, The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, but the pillow of royalty is thickly sown with prickly cares. And it's very true. And we can see this in the example of Meghan Markle. <laughs> it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder. And she really struggled with all of that. <laughs> Another thing to consider is that even though Nebuchadnezzar was a tyrant and a Gentile king, God still gave him a divine dream. Even though he had commended committed horrendous acts, even against God's own people, God is still trying to communicate truths to him. God has not left the heathen world. He is still trying to reveal himself to the broken, imperfect world. Even though God did give Nebuchadnezzar a dream, not everything was revealed to him. And that is true even today. God may partially reveal himself to non-Christians, but until they come to him, they will not truly understand the depths of his revelation. So let's take a look at verse 5, and we'll continue. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show to me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time 
till the times change. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The king that the the thing that the king asked is difficult, and no and no one can show it to the king except the gods, who dwell dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and furious, and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guards, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is, the decree, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. I'm sure the soothsaying Chaldeans were very knowledgeable, but that knowledge was one that led to vanity. I'm sure they wouldn't have had literally stupid men in the court. They would probably be somewhat wise, maybe very educated and enlightened for, for their culture. But that intellectual pride led them to convince others, like the king, to believe that they could foretell the future. Having knowledge and intelligence does not mean you have wisdom and prophetic ability. And there's, there's some churches that I see that, that um, some people really try to use their intelligence. And they can be very, maybe a very high IQ, and they can use that to convince people to do certain things or even pretend to be prophetic just because they're intelligent. And that's not the same thing. Well, Nebuchadnezzar, love him or hate him, wanted to actually test the magicians and the soothsayers and, and the prophets. He wanted to test them. And that, that takes guts. Are you going to actually test them? He wanted to know if they were legitimate. Could they actually hear from the gods? If they couldn't, they would have Severe consequences, the worst of all consequences, death. He was so sick of prophetic wise men who only wanted to pet his ego so they could rise in the ranks of the kingdom. He was so sick of it, and he wanted them to prove to him, are you legit? Or are you just telling me what I want to hear? Or when I give you a dream, or if I give you an idea, and you just interpret it, oh, that's easy enough, but can you tell me the dream and then interpret it? I have found myself lately understanding King Neb Nebuchadnezzar with his irritation of false prophets, though he takes it very extreme, and I would obviously never go that far, <laughs> of wanting to kill someone. I, too, am tired of the fake soothsayers and fake prophets. There's a lot of them on TV. I'm not saying any specific ones, but there's a lot of people who have made a platform on prophesying. And I'm not, I've not gone through all of them, but there are many of them who say prophetic things and they don't even happen. Or they say it in such a vague way that they can't be proved. And it puts a question in your heart. I know there are real modern day prophets who God has anointed with the gift of prophecy, but there are so many fakes that it causes confusion in the body of Christ. 
I can almost find myself becoming angry when I hear another vague false prophecy from a false prophet and they get little to no consequences for that false prophecy. When here these men would literally be killed. Here a a non-Jewish man or non-Christian man was so sick of fake prophecy that he was willing to kill them. And here we, we can have many in our, in our I wouldn't say our denomination, but in the Pentecostal charismatic movement, and we're scared to even call them out. Right? Here's this non-Christian man who's like, oh, I hate this. I am in agony right now. I need a solution. So I'm going to go to God's or God. I, I need a solution. And then he sees all the people he had been listening to all along have no idea. He's like, what's happening? What's happening? So the followers of these prophets that I'm talking about, many of them don't care. They don't ever check up on whether or not they came true because a lot of times they can be so vague, the prophecies can be so vague, that it's hard to check up on it. If, if the prophecy sounds like a fortune cookie, it's not good. <laughs> a good prophecy, it isn't. It shouldn't sound like a fortune cookie. It shouldn't. It should be fairly, um, it, it needs to be provable or non-provable for the most part. Or it's just kind of a form of encouragement, usually. So the, these followers continue to buy their products even though the prophet has said many major false prophecies, all without genuine repentance for any of them. I find myself craving to see the real power of God manifested for his glory. I want to see the gifts of the Spirit as demonstration of God's love and power and not as someone who's using people's faith as a way to line their pockets. Especially when I know God has anointed real people for real prophecy and real interpretation. And to see real healings that brings so much life to the body of Christ. And my heart is aching. And we're so scared to call it out. And I know the main reason is because we don't want to discourage prophecy. Because we feel like there's two teams. There's people who are skeptical of prophecy, and there's people who are for it. And you can't be something in the middle. But what? What? I believe there are going to be false prophets, and actually it says in the Bible that there's going to be more false prophets in the last days. So we need more people calling it out. Right? And so I think that's where the divide happens, is that... We feel like we, f we see the, the, the black and white. Oh, either you're for the prophetic gifts or you're not. You're either for prophecy or you're not. And so if you say anything against prophecy or anyone, anything that, then, oh, you mustn't be for it. Like, no. No. You can call it out and still be for it. You actually are more for it when you call it out when you know for sure it was false when you know for sure it is false. I have he heard genuine prophecy before. I remember my mom having a, a, uh, a dream. It was January of 2020 and of about like a terrible event happening and that God was going to take her family and they're gonna make it through. And then March was COVID, right? It's like, wow. That was provable. <laughs> she, she, it was undeniable. And it was just within a few months of her saying it. And so my heart grieves when I see it. And then I get even angrier when someone who believes in prophecy is being condemned because they point someone out. I've seen that on, on online and YouTube even. One, one guy I, I listened to, he 
is a charismatic Pentecostal. He believes in the power of God, but then he called someone else out and said, hey, you prophesied that Israel was going to have peace. You prophesied that it was going to happen by this time, and it hasn't happened. Stop it. You need to repent. And, and everybody's blowing up against him because this guy is a bigwig that he's coming against. And it's like, what? No. No, we have to call out false prophets. And, and we got to stop taking sides. You, you can be in the middle, and it's okay. It's okay. We're going to continue on in Daniel. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, his companions and told them to seek mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of his wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the, the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. Kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O oh God, my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and now, and now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore, Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the ex exiles from Judah a man who will make known the king the interpretation. The king declared to Dan Daniel, whose name was Balthazar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers, can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to, to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and visions of your, of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, come thoughts of what would be after this, and who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts and the mind. You can see even in verse 29, the humility of Daniel. He says, I don't, I don't have the wisdom to do it. It's just God. And yet the Chaldeans, I'm sure it was out of intellectual pride. Well, I could fool the king to convince him that I have some mag magical ability. And he just enters, I don't really have any special wisdom. But I know God revealed it to me. I know God revealed it to me. This is the first time Daniel has come before the king as someone who has potentially has a prophetic or interpretive gift. This is just Daniel chapter 2. This is the first time. Think how scary that would be. It would be terrifying, and he has so many necks on the line. I don't know how many. I would guess a few dozen up to maybe hundreds of men dependent on whether he has the dream or uh, and the interpretation right. And, of course, his own, which is the most scary for him, I'm sure. Yet when God gave him the interpretation, his first response was praise. Because he trusted God. 
He trusted, he knew it was God. There was a confidence there. He wasn't questioning, was this God, was it not? He knew, he just, oh, God gave me, revealed to me in, in the dream. It's God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for this. He didn't say Jesus because Jesus wasn't born yet, but <laughs> he was, thank you, Yahweh. Thank you. That's how confident he was, that it was God. So for a genuine divine revelation to come to King Nebuchadnezzar, there were four things that had to happen. The first was that his prejudice towards the Jews had to be dismantled. He had to be willing to receive truth, even though it came from a lowly conquered Jew. He was someone, Daniel was someone that the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, had conquered. And so he was just a, a little young man they had conquered. He had to dismantle that prejudice and listen to such a lowly, lowly man. Two, King Nebuchadnezzar had to be desperate for truth. Desperate for it. He had so much angst, so much pain inside of him because of this dream. A hunger for truth above all else had to be in place. Three, his trust in the false prophets and false systems had to be destroyed. He would have never come to Daniel if he didn't call, recognize that the false prophets were false. He had to know it. He had to test it. And see. He had to see. He had to give up. Give up on the false prophets. In earlier um, verses, the false prophets were trying to tell him, oh, there's no man in the kingdom who could. No man. And so Nebuchadnezzar could have said, oh, yeah, you're probably right. I'll just have to deal with some of my own. And he could have listened to that false prophet. He could have. But he had to let them go. Let go of those, of those false prophets. And we have to do that even in our own lives. Is there someone we're listening to that has given a very proclaimed prophecy? And I'm not saying they're just saying something encouraging or blessing their community or something. But they said a prophecy and it did not come true. We have to let them go. If we want to find a true prophet. Or if we want to become one, if God has called and anointed us to become one. We can't follow someone who's false. And then the fourth thing was that King Nebuchadnezzar couldn't give up faith in the idea of deities wanting to reveal something to him. Right? Right? He had to believe in a spiritual realm. Those four things had to exist. So we're going to continue on to verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold a great image. This is Daniel interpreting the dream. A great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on the feet of the iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold altogether were broken in pieces and became like chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain filled with the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the mighty and the glory, 
and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beast of the field, and the bird of the heavens, making you rule over them, and you are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of the iron shall be in it. But just as you saw iron mixed with soft clay, and as toes of the feet were partly iron, partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so will mix with one another in marriage. But they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall kingdom be left to another people. I shall break, it shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that is broke in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and his interpretation sure. The dream and the interpretation is very clear. There will be successive monarchies to come after Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Though they will be lesser than Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, it shows the inevitable march of time. The rise and the fall of every kingdom, no matter how strong, no, no matter how beautiful, nor how powerful, they will inevitably fall and be passed to the next. And at the end of it all, all will fail because they were constructed by human hands. Nothing built by human hands will stand the end of times. The colossal statue stood brilliant but terrible. According to the pulpit commentary, this metaphor for the kingdom represents the statue that even though they look, even though the kingdom looks grand and beautiful, underneath the veneer is numerous human atrocities like brutality, slavery, and selfish tyranny. No matter how terrible their tyranny was, it was temporary. And they would all be subjugated to the final destruction. All these monarchies were corrupted by obsession of luxuries and ambition. But all their fates will be the same. They will all end. No kingdom based on unjust power is stable. No kingdom without God is stable. In verse 44, Daniel proclaims that God will set up a kingdom that will not pass away. And many scholars believe that this is Christ's kingdom. When Jesus came to earth and died on the cross, he set up a new kingdom, an eternal kingdom, that will destroy all other kingdoms, but shall be eternal. This kingdom shall not pass hands. The king shall rule forever. Our King Jesus will rule forever. Okay, I'm going to finish up here. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and an incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors, many great gifts, made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief perfect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. 
but Daniel remained at the king's court. Here Daniel entered with honesty and declared the word of the Lord forthrightly. He did not try to flatter Nebuchadnezzar with delusions of hope. Do you hear me? With delusions of hope. He revealed in his interpretation that the Chaldean dinosaur dynasty would remain would not remain forever. That would be pretty scary to reveal to a king who's pretty proud and saying, hey, your dynasty is not going to last forever. And actually, there's going to be many kingdoms that come after you. But that's a very important note, even in this day and age. If a modern-day prophet only prophesies positive things, they are probably only trying to flatter you. And they disguise it under encouragement. Don't get me wrong. Positive prophecies have their place if they're true. If they're true. But if there is a prophet who's only saying positive things in pretty much every prophecy when God hasn't led them to, what they're doing is just as bad as the king's soothsayers. The word soothsayers saying soothing things. They are just as bad as the magicians and the sorcerers and the soothsayers. And some of the people might be well-meaning, but it doesn't change the fact that they are saying they're speaking for God when they aren't. I think that's the core of the concept of don't say the Lord's name in vain. Right? Right? Really saying it in vain. And several are, are only saying that encouraging thing to climb the ladder, the, the Christian sphere ladder, so they can get bigger places to speak at. There's a quote by Thomas Sowell that says, when you want to help people, you tell them the truth. When you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. It was incredible to see that Nebuchadnezzar, even with all his faults, valued truth over flattery. Nebuchadnezzar raises Daniel up. He knows a man like Daniel is worthy of incredible trust. Power and control cannot be put in better hands. If you cannot be trusted with little, you cannot be trusted with much. But Daniel could be trusted with little, therefore he was likely to be trusted with much. Daniel received the reward he deserved. A man who put God above all got what he deserved. And that doesn't always hop, happen. We see that in life. But in this story, it did. He devoted himself to prayer, worship, honesty, integrity, and God saw him through. In conclusion, like Daniel, there are people out there that God has anointed to prophesy, to interpret, and to do miracles. God has anointed people out there just like Daniel. And it could be one of you guys as well, or one of you guys listening. But we have to weed out the lies. We have to weed out the prejudices. We have to be determined to not fall for flattery so that we can listen to the real voice of God. We have to be willing so that we can listen to real men and women of God. Sister Kathy. I'm going to say a quick prayer and we can be dismissed. And you guys can come up for, for prayer afterwards. And just let the Holy Spirit lead you. Lord, I pray that you give us wisdom to not fall for false prophets. Give us wisdom to listen to the ones that you have anointed. 
I pray for those who have been anointed but have not spoken up. If they have been anointed, God, and you've given them a prophetic word, give them the boldness to speak. God, I pray that you continue to have, God, I pray that these people will continue to have a reverent fear of you and have a fear to not misspeak for you. But if you've truly given them a word, I pray that you give them that confidence to speak. I also pray that you continue to bring accountability to the gift of prophecy in America and across the world. It's a real gift and we pray, God, that, that it will not lead thousands astray. We want people to experience the real gift of prophecy, the real gift of interpretation. Let us not be afraid to call out false prophecies with tactfulness and wisdom because we crave the real thing. Ultimately, let us hunger and thirst for you, God, because we want the real thing, God. We want your genuine power, God. I pray if any of us has ever spoken something in, in the heart of prophecy, we were trying to do it in a prophecy, and we were wrong, God, I pray that we repent and we lay it before you. But we also pray that those people who have a platform, who have not repented, I pray that they will repent, they will see how misguided they are and how much confusion they're causing to the body of Christ. God, but we thank you, God. I pray that you give us wisdom and power to go forward in our life. We don't have to choose one or the other. We don't have to choose one or the other. Either we're for prophetic gifts or the other. We are for prophetic gifts, but we're also against false prophecy. God, and we thank you for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.